Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. Today's topic is new hope for narcolepsy. Is the future nearly here? In the last few years, a number of new drugs have become available for the treatment of narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. And a recent article featured a controlled trial of an orexin receptor agonist in the New England Journal of Medicine, which sparked considerable interest. I am joined today um, to discuss the present and future of management of disorders of hypersomnolence by my uh, guest, Dr. Michael Silber, a professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a board-certified sleep specialist. Mike. There have been several new forms of oxibate therapies marketed recently, which can be confusing for both providers and patients. Could you tell us a little bit about how these differ from the original sodium oxibate formulation and what role these might play in treating these disorders? Thank you, Maitri. Let me start by saying I'm going to be talking about, obviously, a number of drugs today, and I think I should just tell listeners I have no commercial relationships with the manufacturers of any of the drugs I'm going to talk about, so I hope I'm reasonably impartial. Well, you know, those of us who manage narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia are familiar with sodium oxybate over the last few years, a drug of uncertain mechanism, quite different from the usual stimulants, but which does seem to be extremely helpful for cataplexy and plays a distinct role in improving sleep in narcoleptic patients and also daytime sleepiness. Now, those of us who've used sodium oxybate know it's a little clumsy to use. The patients have to take a dose before bed and then another dose four hours later. It is dispensed by one pharmacy nationwide. It's all manageable, but it's just a little bit of a hassle. Well, recently, two new forms of oxybate have come on the market. The first is something called lower sodium oxybate, which is produced by the same company. It produces sodium oxybate, but it's a, their cations are now a combination of sodium Sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, so the sodium load is lowered. How important this is, is uncertain. I think if a patient has hypertension, it's certainly a good idea to lower sodium. Maybe it's a good idea to lower sodium for everybody. And I think in future, we're more and more, if we're going to use this form of oxybate, we're going to prescribe the lower sodium oxybate form. And for those not really familiar, I'll mention the trade names. The original one, of course, was Zyrem, and this is now being marketed as Zywav. But the way it's given is exactly the same twice a night. With one exception, the new trials also included idiopathic hypersomnia patients, and there was some concern that because, of course, oxybate is sedating, that if one has a lot of sleep inertia in the morning, which so many of those classic idiopathic hypersomnia patients have, a dose in the middle of the night might not be such a good idea. So they did try up to six grams in a single dose before bed, and it was just as effective and didn't seem to worsen inertia. And in fact, oxybate is now the first drug actually FDA approved for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. The second new one produced by a different company and marketed as Lumris um, is an extended release form of sodium oxybate, which is given as one dose before bed, same dosage schedule as the old sodium oxybate in two doses. Whether this is going to be more convenient and easier for patients and or more effective or less effective or just as effective is uncertain at present, but it's really nice to see multiple forms of oxybate on the market because it gives patients more choice. One can look at competitive pricing and things like that. So people should be familiar with these new drugs if it's being used. The last thing
thing I'll say about Oxybait is most of the trials were done with the Oxybait preparation as an adjunctive medication. Most of the patients in the trials were also on st conventional stimulants of some sort. So the role of Oxybait alone is a little less certain, but we certainly have patients that we use alone when they've had side effects or don't respond to traditional stimulants. That is very helpful, Mike. Thank you for providing that additional information, particularly about these newer formulations. So along those lines, um, there are two other new drugs which have come to the market in the past few years, uh, both solriampitol and pitolescent. Do you think you could tell us a little bit about how these drugs work and what their role is in treating these conditions? Well, again, great to see new drugs for narcolepsy. Solriampitol is a um, monoamine reuptake inhibitor. It increases dopamine, it increases norepinephrine. So it's not all that different from traditional stimulants, but it certainly seems to have fewer sympathomimetic side effects than methylphenidate and the amphetamines. It's used as 75 and 150 milligrams in a single dose in the morning. And the results of the controlled trials were really fairly impressive in the um, the, the it improved Epworth sleepiness scale, maintenance of wakefulness tests, latencies, not to normal. None of the drugs are currently available bring them into totally normal ranges, but significant improvements. And the global impression, clinician global impression number, the percentage patients the clinician thought were improved or very much improved was a very robust 83%, which is higher than most narcoleptic drugs. So I think it has a distinct role to play. Pitolicent is a little different. It's histaminergic. Technically, it's an H3 inverse histamine agonist, but practically it increases histamine. So it's a different monoamine. First drug we've had, which increases histamine in these um, patients. And again, there was improvement. Not fantastic, but again, there was statistically significant improvement in the Epworth and the MWT. And 73% of clinicians felt there was improved or very much improved. Strange dosage schedule starts at 8.9 milligrams daily and builds up to 35.6. One or two cautions, pitolicent is metabolized by the liver, therefore, like modafinil, can interfere with the efficacy of the oral contraceptive and other drugs needing the um, cytochrome system to catabolize them. And it also increases the QTC on the ECG, wise to get one before, especially for patients also on other antidepressants, for instance, or other drugs which can increase the QTC interval on the ECG. Um, the other nice thing about pitolicent, it's said to be very effective for cataplexy, whereas solriamfetol wasn't particularly effective. So nice to have those two new drugs available. Definitely. It is. I agree with you, Mike. It's, it's nice to see these new drugs with different mechanisms of action to offer us some other options when we're managing these patients. So that then brings us to the future. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine and what this might mean for the future of narcolepsy therapy? Well, everything we have, the conventional stimulants, including modafinil, soriamfetol, pitolicent, oxybate, none of them work on the primary problem, which at least for narcolepsy type 1 is an absence of orexin or um, an absence of, absence of the neurotransmitter, the peptide neurotransmitter orexin. Um, so... Everything is downstream management. Now, you can't take orexin by mouth. It doesn't get absorbed intramuscularly. It doesn't get into the brain. In animals, infusing it into the CSF has been effective, but not practical in humans, obviously. So it was fantastic to see this article in earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine of a phase two multinational uh, uh, drug company sponsored, of course, trial on the first um, 
well, one of the first orexin two receptor agonists. In other words, drugs that look like orexin, um, like hypocretin, which of course is the other name for it, which can be absorbed orally, cross the blood-brain barrier and bind to the receptor. This drug has the name of TAC 994 after the company Takeda, which is producing it. And the phase two trial was of 73 patients, um, double-blind controlled, and it was and the, it lasted eight weeks and the results were utterly fantastic um the maintenance of wakefulness test latencies went up to between 31 and 40 minutes and you'll remember this is within normal range the epwis sleepiness scale dropped to 1.5 to 5 which is well within normal range and no drug to date in trial for narcolepsy in a controlled trials ever shown results that has moved the figures into the absolute normal range. Cataplexy dropped from 11 per week to an average of one per week. So sort of a fantastic result, but regrettably, five of the 73 patients developed increased liver enzymes, three severely, and the company has discontinued working with this particular drug as a result. They've also published a result, the results of another trial of intravenous infusion of a different OX, um, OX2R agonist given for nine hours of intravenous infusion a day for a week, um, for an entire week. And again, the results were absolutely fantastic. Um, the maintenance of wakefulness test mean latency went up to 38 out of 40 minutes, and the EPWA sleepiness scale dropped to zero in the in the patients tried with, with patients with narcolepsy type one. But of course, everybody agrees, including the company, this is completely impractical. Um, but I understand they are working now with additional oral agents, which hopefully won't be hepatotoxic and may um, produce the same sort of results. Now, if we can get an oral agent which works at this level and is sustained at this level without significant side effects, this will revolutionize treatment. I mean, at least for narcolepsy type 1, we'll have to think about narcolepsy type 2 and idiopathic hypersomnia, but this will be fantastic. The only other thing I'll mention from the trials is patients seem to develop increased urinary frequency from these agents. It doesn't seem to be overwhelmingly distressing, but it does seem to be an unavoidable side effect so far. Those are very impressive results that you shared with us, Mike, um, and, and definitely exciting for next steps in the future. What final messages would you like to leave with our listeners? Well, the nice thing about narcolepsy management, and for that matter, idiopathic hypersomnia, is we have so many drugs available at the moment that the vast, I find the vast majority of my patients, I can bring to a point where they can lead a relatively normal life. And this makes managing these patients really, really so satisfactory. And the patients are very grateful in general for any help we can give them. But the future looks even brighter. And if we can find um, usable erexin to our agonists, um, this may revolutionize the whole field. Very exciting time to be working in narcolepsy. Thanks very much for sharing your expertise with the audience today, Dr. Silber, and for uh, all of you who tuned into our podcast today. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you.